all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so this is an interesting study from nih it is a preprint study the summary of the study is that the researchers have found sars cov 2 to be present almost in every organ of our body and almost in all kind of cells including testis ovary and other reproductive system cells including cardiovascular system and most importantly including our brain the study is based on autopsy and if you remember my previous discussions um, i used to say that in case of an autopsy we have to be careful because when a per- person is dying many of the barriers and systems are crashing and and breaking so virus can if present in the blood it can actually go to those tissues and be found there this is the first study where they actually specifically answered this comment to say that hey there are going to be people who would say that there is viremia that is virus in the blood and that might caused the contamination of other tissues and they said we only found viremia in two out of all the patients that we did autopsy on so they specifically looked for this one indicator and ruled it out the other interesting thing for me is that in some patients they found the virus to be in multiple variations so they found variants within one person and they found that various tissues had variants compared to the lung tissue and then the most important part of this study is that they are saying it is possible that virus the sars-cov-2 can sustain and stay and persist in replicative form for months and even up to 230 days I think 230 days claim we would look at that together it is actually in chronically immunosuppressed patient which we would expect that these patients might have the virus for a long time but then there are other patients who are not immunosuppressed and we we'll look at the data for them so this is the basic gist of the discussion today let's start our um let's share our screen and see it so this is drbean.com in the description there is a link to this there are another 900 videos on drbean.com and as many of you have been saying that hey we are uh, non medicals and we just want to educate ourselves instead of using this work professionally and so i've put this 67 back and i got some more comments from some healthcare professionals saying i'm not able to have uh, i'm not able to buy for 97 so sure you can buy it for 67 as well but if you are a healthcare professional who is going to use this education for your work you are a lawyer you are a uh, let's say a, an um, artist or you are a journalist then you can click on the pricing here and uh, maybe use the full price as well so with this here is the a small article about the study it is interesting this is december 26 2021 so almost 8 uh, months ago this is the article itself that will go over this is the pdf that will go over and then there are a couple of references that are interesting as well so let's start with my drawings and i have the study open here as well here and we'll go over this study a little more here too okay so with this these are our gifts for humanity they are continuing and wishing you all staying safe and healthy and happy now if you first of all let me reduce a fear here that is that this study does not add to the prognosis of sars-cov-2 meaning if there is a percentage of people who die this study does not say that more than that will die 
So please keep this in mind that this is not to scare us, but instead to see what they found. And this study is on autopsies. This is one of the rare studies because it is by NIH. They have fewer studies that are out there. So this study included patients who died from April 26, 2020 to March 2, 2021. It is a preprint study, and they showed, they proved in this study that virus can actually persist for months after the infection. So there were 44 autopsies that were done. 44 patients died and their tissues were harvested within, or samples were taken within 26 hours and then frozen and then uh, observed. 38 of these patients who died were seroconverted. That is, their immune system was responding to the virus while they died. Now, what they did was, they said a patient who had infection today, for example, then they would just keep monitoring them. If, sadly, unfortunately, they died, then at the time of their death, they would take their tissue samples. The abstract of the study, the summary of the study is, they found the virus to be widely, widely distributed in the tissues and cells of the person, even if the infection was asymptomatic. So the message that you would see in this study is that asymptomatic, mild symptomatic, severe, in all those cases, virus did, does tend to spread to other tissues. That is one. Another important thing that I think is really interesting, that is they did not see, they did not see inflammation in every tissue where the virus went. So they saw the most inflammation in pulmonary system, respiratory system. But when they observed the virus in other tissues, they did not see corresponding increased inflammation in those tissues, which is a good news. At the same time, it is a bad news as well. The bad news is that if the virus is sitting in there and inflammation is not occurring, that means the immune system is not really interested in removing that virus. And that virus can continue to sit there and cause the lo local tissue destruction, which would then cause inflammatory markers to be produced and spread in the body, and a continuous percolation of the disease, baseline disease may be present. They also had a very interesting um, idea for why the virus is persisting. And they said that in the past we have observed, and I'm going to quickly show you that study. So give me one second. So this is a book called Microbiome by Javits. In this book, if you see here, this is about measles. So this discussion I'm doing today, I'm using measles as an example. Not that measles and the SARS-CoV-2 are present together. That is not what I'm saying. Because the authors used measles as an example to provide the reasoning for why SARS-CoV-2 sits in our tissues for longer, I wanted to make sure that you can understand what measles does. So here, in some patients of measles, the virus, the measles virus, sits in the brain tissue and lives there for a long time and eventually causes brain inflammation and brain damage. The question became, why does measles in some people live in their brain tissues for such a long time? And it turned out that measles virus, when it is building itself, Somehow the gene to develop the envelope, and let me draw a little. So if I go to the side here, and let's say this is a measles virus and it has a little envelope on it, just like SARS-CoV-2 has an envelope. They found that 
in some patients, the gene for the, the RNA of the measles virus is defective in an area that is responsible to make or to help build the envelope. This is like if you are making parts of a car and you are able to successfully make tires and, and doors and, and engine, but you're not able to make the car's body itself. So now the engine and the tires and the other parts are just littered around on the floor of the factory because there are no bodies. So imagine that the gene that is responsible to help make the envelope, that gene is damaged. So then what happens is this virus inside the cell continues to make its little parts, but is not able to make a good envelope. And because of that, it just sits in this cell forever. It just does not get out. And because it does not get out, it is not attacked. And because it is sitting in vesicles, it is not presented outside. And so this defective virus sitting in the brain tissue is just at a lower level, continues to bother the brain tissue and continues to create inflammation that takes many years to start the brain damage. They are saying that it is possible that SARS-CoV-2 is defective in some patients and it just sits in there in their cells. It is not coming out of the cell. It just has partially built bodies which are just sitting in the cell and that is how it is persisting. Now, before I continue with the study, I want to add this comment. We have been talking about long COVID and vaccine injury and autophagy. I feel, and this is just me feeling and opining, and so that means I can be totally wrong, but I feel for this kind of a situation solution is in autophagy. Because autophagy will make a cell look inside of it find where are some garbage pieces, where are some extra material present which can be broken down to be used and recycled for making energy. In that process, these hidden little vesicles filled with this trash can be recycled or can be induced to be recycled. So I think autophagy is a very important thing to keep in mind. So back here, they found that the damaged viruses or viruses, RNA and sgRNA, and I'll explain what is sgRNA, in all tissues, majority of the tissues and cells in the body. They actually found even in asymptomatic patients, they found that these RNAs were present even up to 230 days. And hold it, if you have this thought in your mind that, well, presence of RNA means nothing, it's just piece of RNA, it may have gone from the lung and floated around in the blood and went into another cell, so what? The sgRNA, which is a smaller piece of RNA, which is an indication of the active replication, they actually found sgRNA almost in all tissues as well. So I would explain a little later what sgRNA is, but hold that thought in your mind that I have to prove to you, and this is the authors that are doing it, I'm just presenting, I have to prove to you that this is not just RNA floating around, but it is actually replication competent virus present for months after the infection. They also found that people had variants in them. They also found that very less inflammation was observed outside of the pulmonary system. So their conclusion was viral persistence and replication in systemic tissue and for months may contribute to long COVID. One, systemic, outside of just the pulmonary system. And second, for months. So this is it. This is the basic summary of the um, discussion. This is the abstract of it, that in some patients, the virus can stay there for months after the actual acute infection. Now let's go into the, the details. So here is what they did. Some more characteristics of the study. There were 29.5% females. 70.5% were males. Diverse across race and ethnicity. Mean age was 59.2 
years, there was 95.5% had of the patients at least one comorbidity. 81.8% required intubation and invasive ventilation. 22.7% were put on ECMO. And these numbers are not to be added up to 100 because there could be multiple things happening in one person. 40.9% had renal replacement therapy. 35.2 days was the mean time to death after the initial infection. What they did was, within 26 hours, 26.2 hours mean, they would collect tissue samples and various body fluids. For example, blood, urine, CSF, other fluids. Now a quick refresher about the RNA and sgRNA. So imagine this is the RNA of the SARS-CoV-2. We know that the SARS-CoV-2 RNA has multiple genes in it. For example, open reading frame 1A, 1B, then S protein spike, E, M, N. So there are multiple genes. Then once this RNA is present, it is so funny, um, and many viruses do it. It's not just the SARS-CoV-2. So imagine this is the main RNA you could actually pick up a small part of this RNA, which will be able to make a complete protein. So it's a subgenomic RNA. It's a part of the main bigger RNA. So if you have a recipe book, let's say there is a recipe book about making chicken recipes, and then you take one chapter out of it, and that itself is a recipe. And if you have the whole book, that is also recipes. So that little chapter that you took out is called subgenomic RNA or part of an RNA. Now, why is that important? A subgenomic RNA's presence means that there is active replication going on. The virus is actually dividing. Viruses' proteins are actively picking up the main big RNA cutting it down into smaller pieces, which will then be used to make more proteins of the virus, more machinery of the virus, which will then be made to either do the function of replication or become part of the virus. So presence of sgRNA or presence of smaller pieces of RNA is indication of replication going on in the cell. If the RNA just floated around and entered a cell, which it cannot. But let's say if a RNA just entered a cell, then most of the time it does not have its enzymes, the polyprotein or MPROs or 3CL pros. It doesn't have those enzymes to, to break it down into smaller pieces of the RNAs to make more proteins. So in such cases, if it is not replicating RNA, just some RNA from foreign cells that appeared here, then the RNA will not be doing anything other than just being present. So presence of us, sgRNA is an indication of effective replication. And what they did was, they not only observed RNA in patients, they observed in the acute patients, almost everyone had sgRNA. In the late phase patients, delayed infection time, they saw sgRNA present in majority of those patients too. That's a very important, that's a crux of this discussion, that they found sgRNA. If they had not found sgRNA, I would have thrown this study out, at least for, I would not have presented it, because RNA could be just a contamination. But here they are proving that this was not a contamination. Then they're showing the smaller pieces of RNA to prove that this was actually active replication happening within the cell months after the original infection. Now what they did was they classified the patient into early, mid and late stages. What does that mean? A patient who died after the initial onset of the symptoms within the 14 days. And they called it an early infection. If a patient died within 15 to 30 days, then they called it mid-infection duration. And if the patient died after 30 days, then they called it late. 
and they were 14 late, they were 13 in the mid and 17 in the early. What they found, what tissue samples they took, they almost took tissue samples from everywhere. However, they were looking at them in brain, cerebellum. Can you imagine the cerebellum of the brain had the SARS-CoV-2 in it? Brain, cerebellum, even eyes, ocular tissue had SARS-CoV-2 in it. Lungs, heart, GIT, lymphoid tissue, for example, lymph nodes, spleen, liver, uh, the peripheral nerves, endocrine system, they actually found it in the thyroid and the suprarenals and other glands, kidney, and the productive systems, ovaries, testis, muscles, they found the virus in the muscles, skin, adipose tissue, they found it in the fat cells, and more. So these were just some. And what they found was, they looked at the burden of the virus genome in various tissues. What does that mean? They looked at the N protein. Remember, nucleocapsid protein is a protein for the active virus. They looked at the N protein genetic material in various tissue cells. And they found, if you see here, they found the largest load or burden, as they call it, in the respiratory tissue. So that was more than 100,000 N antigen or N genes, sorry, not antigens, N gene copies per nanogram RNA. And to give you a context, in this paper, they called five or greater N gene copies as high. So if it is higher than 100,000, then that is very high. So the largest load was seen in the respiratory system. Then they saw in the brain, 90.9% of the patients whose brain samples they had taken, I think they had taken 10 patients' brain sample, and 9%, 9 of them had the virus in them. So 90.9% had the virus in the brain. 97.7% had the virus in their lungs. 79.5%, almost 80%, had their heart with the virus. And inside the heart, the myocardium, that is the heart muscle, then the heart's layers, they all had the virus in them. Even pericardium, the covering of the heart, had the virus in them. GIT, 72.7% of the patient had the virus in GIT lining. 86.4% had the virus in their lymphoid tissues, that is lymph nodes, spleen, liver, etc. Malt, gallt. Uh, malt is the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. Gart is the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, so lymphoid tissue. 63.6% had their, their endocrine system and renal system involved and especially thyroid and suprarenals. 42.5% had their reproductive system involved. Muscle, skin, adipose tissue, 68.2%. And these tissues had at least 100 N gene copies. Remember, they call greater than 5 to be high. And so these tissues had at least 100 copies. Then they say that the burden reduced as the duration increased. So early stage patients had the most burden, that is the acute patients. Then between 50 to 30, the burden was less. That means the body was actually trying to handle the virus. Then greater than 30, the burden was even more less. That, that is, again, the body was trying to handle it. Still, they say that all of them, regardless of their stage, had more than five, five or more N gene copies per nanogram of RNA, which they called it in their study, they called it very high or high levels. Then look at this, sgRNA, those smaller subgenomic RNA pieces. At least in one tissue, 
of 61.5% of mild, that is 15 to 30 days, and 42.9% of late. Those patients who were actually months after, 42.5.9% patients had active replication of virus occurring in their tissues, or at least in one tissue. Then this is a very interesting um, data point, cell tropism. And I'll go over this. And I think you may have this uh, in your mind as well. So before I continue, I hope that I've answered this question that is this active replication or not? So SGRNA's presence shows that it is active replication. Now the cell tropism, what cells had it? And they have a long list of it. I could not draw them all and I could not put them all. So I'm going to go and show it there on their on their document or manuscript found in 36 distinct cell types. So let's look at the cell types. It is on line number 192. So before we go there, check this out as well. Intra-individual viral variant diversity. So within the individuals, within one patient, various tissues would have various variants of the virus. So check this out. However, we also noted important patterns of intra-individual virus diversity in several patients from the early group, acute infection. In patient number 27, although all 4,525 inferred spike amino acid sequences were identical, two virus haplotypes, each with a single synonymous substitution, were preferentially detected in extrapulmonary sites, including right and left ventricles, heart, and mediastinal lymph node, the lymph nodes inside the chest. So that is a very interesting thing. So now let's go to 190, these cells. So here, 194, SARS-CoV-2 cellular tropism. I'm going to read some cell types. Overall, we detected SARS-CoV-2 RNA via ISH in 36 distinct cell types across all sampled organs. Heart contains spike RNA within myocyte, heart cell. Endothelium, myocyte is the heart, heart muscle cell. Endothelium is the inner covering of the heart and the blood vessels. Smooth muscles of the blood vessels. So under that covering is the smooth muscles and of both early cases. The pericardium, the covering of the heart, demonstrated a positive signal for spike RNA within fibroblasts of the stroma. So stroma is the connective tissue, the th the the tough layer of the covering and it has fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are the little cells that make fibers for connective tissue. And they found the fibroblasts to have the virus in it. Intimal cells of the aorta. So tunica intima is a layer of the blood vessel wall. So aorta, aorta's blood vessel wall, aorta's wall had the virus in it. Similarly, mononuclear leukocytes within the lymph nodes. So monocytes within the lymph nodes, spleen, etc. Epithelial cells. Epithelial cells are those cells that are on the surface and are facing outwards. So that would mean skin cells, the mucosal cells of the mouth, nose, GIT, a reproductive system, and so on. Uh, even the urinary system. So epithelial cells had it. Stratified squamous epithelium of esophagus had it, or esophagus had it. Mononuclear leukocytes were against, again visualized with SARS-CoV-2 RNA in lymphoid aggregates in the interstitium of the small and large intestine. Kupfer cells in the liver, hepatocytes, bile duct epithelium, bile ducts epithelium, the covering of the bile duct, which is bringing the bile from the liver to the GIT, to the intestine, that had it. Within the kidney, the spike RNA could be visualized within parietal epithelium of Bowman's capsule collecting duct, distal tubules, and glomerular endothelium. So if I can very quickly draw this, our kidney functional unit has something called a Bowman's capsule. Then we have proximal convoluted tubule. Then we have the loop of Henle descending limb, hairpin turn, ascending limb, then distal convoluted tubule, and then collecting ducts. 
then these collecting ducts collect from various parts and then they start becoming the you know u- ureters and uh, kidneys pelvis and then ureter anyways here what they're saying is that this layer of the bowman capsule so here <clears throat> excuse me within parietal epithelium of the bowman's capsule so here all of these visceras have visceral layer and parietal layer or the coverings so here's a parietal epithelium the virus was in it collecting duct this part virus was in the, the surface of this distal tubules this part and glomerular endothelium so this is the glomerulus and the endothelium inside here sorry the sorry what what did i say i was wrong here the glomerular endothelium is the blood vessels that are coming in here bringing the blood and their surfaces that is the endothelium that also had the virus the whole thing was infected so quite a lot of distribution endocrine follicular cells of the thyroid glandular cells of pancreas were also had the spike rna among reproductive system spike rna was visualized visualized within leydig and sertoli cells of the testis so these are the cells that are helping the sperms uh, grow and mature and nourish and then go on to their way germ cells within testicular tubules endometrial gland epithelium endometrial stromal cells women uterine smooth muscles and stromal cells of the post menopause ovary myocytes muscle cells within skeletal muscle endothelium of the blood vessels schwann cells of the brain spike rna was found in neurons glia and ependyma so these are the ependymas are the coverings glia are the um, supporting tissue cells and the immune system cells and schwann cells are the cells that are making coverings for the neurons then look at this within the cerebellum specifically neurons purkinje cells and endothelium of vasculature also contain spike protein purkinje cells are cells that are present in the uh, cerebellum purkinje are also present in the cerebrum so this is how vast and then these are the uh, histological changes there's a lot more here to go over then finally the question why and i explained that before they say in their um, manuscript these data coupled with i said suggest that sars cov2 can replicate within tissue for over 3 months after infection in some individuals with rna failing to clear from multiple compartments for up to day 230 this persistence of viral rna and sg rna may represent infection with defective virus which has been described in persistent infection with measles virus another single stranded enveloped rna virus in case of subacute sclerosing pan encephalitis so now what they say is they conclude by saying the mechanism contributing to post acute syndrome or long covid are still being investigated however ongoing systemic and local inflammatory response have been proposed to play a role our data provide evidence for delayed viral clearance this is the first time i'm hearing a study that shows this before this there have been studies from dr bruce peterson that he s1 is hanging out in the monocytes for a long time here they are actually showing much more than the s1 present in many more cells and then they say this is very important but do not support significant inflammation outside of the respiratory tract even among patients who died months after symptoms onset then they say we need to learn more and understand more now the final part i want to show you i have a criticism of this study in one area and i want to show you that again good work done but here is something that is interesting this number that they use 230 days this is what i wanted to show you so these are this is all the patients there were total 44 so they could actually put their data in front of us in here if you see the first column is the patient id the second is the sex of the patient the third one is the age and the fourth one is duration of illness in days this is what is interesting so if i go here 
where it says 230. So this is the third row from the bottom. Patient number 42, male, 68 years, and had the virus up till 230 days. However, if you look at their comorbidities, you would see chronic immunosuppression, liver transplant and immunosuppression. We had done a case from South Africa where we saw that a patient of HIV had the virus even up to 230, 40 days afterwards. So in the immunosuppressed patients, it is possible for viruses to stay there because the immune system is not able to fight them. And because of that, saying that every they have observed that it can stay there up till 230 days is kind of a little, it needs to be corrected. It is fine, they saw it up till 230, but that is not for a healthy patient. So now if I go back and see which patients were not immunosuppressed and what was the maximum number of days they saw for them, that may be a better uh, check to see. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So if I see here for the larger number of days, this is another larger number of days, 204. So this is patient number 29, male, 60 years, 204 days for the infection, but they are also chronic immunosuppressed. So now let's see, for example, here, 76. Patient number 33, male, 71, they had up to 76 days, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, history of Lyme. So this is kind of not immunosuppressed. Here is another 99 days. Patient number 20, male, 42 years of age, 99 days of virus in them, and diabetes mellitus in HLD. So then here is an 82 their only comorbidity was obesity. That is also a large time. It's about three months you're seeing. So in my opinion, these numbers, three months, um, three and a half month, these are more reliable number than looking at an immunosuppressed patient's number to say that here we saw, I think they should have excluded these two patients because these seems to be not the actual, th these are uh, outliers. So this is the discussion. Um, let me see if there is any quick question here. This tells me, so this is now Mubin, and once again, Mubin can be totally wrong. This tells me autophagy is very important. This tells me to induce the autophagy is very important. This tells me that even after the infection is over, doing some sort of a, uh, therapy to keep trying to make sure that the virus is removed is also very important. Um, this also tells me initial early um, attack on the virus aggressively is also very important. We should not let it get hold into the tissues like this. But again, it, it's not something that we can just throw it out. But it is really important for us to have autophagy and number to have those therapies that can help. So this is the discussion. Thank you very much. Um, let's see a couple of questions before we close. Doug says, if these are people who died from COVID, how does it relate to, to long COVID? So the relation is that they found that for months after the virus was replicating in the tissues, brain, ovary, testis, and they are saying that they cannot do this on to live human beings to say, hey, you may have long COVID, can I check your brain tissue? So they are saying that presence of the virus may be an indication of why long COVID is occurring. So this is one possibility. We know we've been talking about long COVID for a long time. There are so many possibilities, so much research, so many ways that the long COVID can occur. This is one method, one possibility. John says, does it indicate if each patient was vaccinated? It does not. So these were from what March 2020 to 2021. So vaccines were out. No, it does not say that. Um,
Denise says, has it wear that long? How are they testing? These patients unfortunately died, so they collected their uh, tissue samples and tested them. But their first infection was tested as a standard process. So, Paul, you're correct. So these were not exact 9 out of 10, but some number, uh, but similar number. My hope is that some, some of these things, one can just go and look into the uh, manuscript. Dave said, do we know the VAC status? At least I don't see it here. Jim says, looks like it can be turned into a time bomb. So, Jim, if we use measles as an example, the defective virus in the measles, and I'm going to share here and try to find the word vaccine. Maybe they have that data. So there is just one occurrence of the word vaccine, and that is for reference. Vaccine Research Center so some reference here, but not, they haven't gotten that in their data. So back here, could this be a time bomb? So if you take them, and they have no proof of defective virus persistence. They do not have a proof. They have a conjecture. So if I go back here and say defective They have this study, 25, SIDHU MSA all, defective measles virus in human subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. And then they have the word here. This persistence of viral RNA and sgRNA may represent, may represent infection with defective virus, which has been described in persistent infection with measles virus. Another single standard enveloped RNA virus in case of subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. So they are kind of equating it to that, but they are not able to actually prove that that is what happened. Or they could not find what the defect is. However, they are able to demonstrate the virus can be present in the tissues beyond two months. Remember, we knew that in the GIT, the virus can persist up to 59 days after the symptoms are over. Here they're showing more than that. And maybe the virus actually is there for even more time, but unfortunately these are the patients who died and their data was present. Susan says, do other viruses do this? So Susan, just like uh, these measles virus uh, possibility, there are actually other viruses as well that can cause brain encephalitis because they go and they sit in the brain and they do not get out. And that causes a slow inflammation of the brain that damages the brain. So Dave says, were these any of these Omicron or do they indicate the strain they had? So the time frame is a possibility to see what could be the one. I do not think these were Omicron times. So if I go back up to the top here, <clears throat> March 26, 2020 to March 2, 2020, sorry, April 26, 2020 to March 2, 2021, way before the Omicron time, right? Omicron appeared in December, November, December of 2021. And this is ending at March 2, 2021. So meanwhile says, is there any antiviral medicine that could sweep remaining viruses? So of course, if we just talk about antiviruses, and I'll say this and people are just going to start yelling at me, but Paxlovid as an antiviral, other antivirals for RNA viruses can also be that. Then we also know some of the drugs that I cannot talk here. These could be that. And then inducing the autophagy would also be helpful.
So words, words says, can any other virus go into all parts of body? Some viruses do, yes, but not all. For example, look at HIV, what it does, but some viruses can actually go, just like measles can. However, this virus is still, it takes a trophy on everything else. I cannot provide you an equal of this virus because if there was another equal of this virus and that virus will be doing the similar amount of damage. Idania, Idania says, is this defect how the mutations new strain occur if it ends up dominating the system? Yes. So you can imagine this. I, I used to talk about this that in all of us, when the virus is replicating, it would make very similar virus to original parent. Then some daughters will be very different and competent as well. And then some daughters will be very different, but defective as well. Imagine a baby born with uh, disabilities. So these are these are possibly those viruses that were defective daughters and now they are not able to complete themselves. And because they're not able to complete themselves, they become a stealth virus that cannot get out of the cell, but is just sitting in the vesicles and hanging out there. And the cell is, is so um, disabled from doing anything to this because it is just sitting in there. And that is how they're persisting and they're causing continuous botheration and that would cause a low level of inflammation if not a very high level. So with this, thank you very much. Uh, please like, subscribe and share. There are some links in the description if you would like to support this work. You can buy me a coffee or you can use PayPal or you can become part of Substack. You can become part of Doc Dr. Bean YouTube channel as well. And for those of you who want to have more lectures for $67. There is a link in the description for that as well. And sometimes people tell me that I am just collecting revenue. And imagine 900 lectures that have made over six years for $67. $67 is not even two times meal. And that is, that is it. That's a one-time payment. And I sometimes become very surprised that how people do not even feel how the value of something is. And maybe that is because they, it is not for them. Anyways, anyone who would like to have that access to about 900 lectures, there is a link in the description. With this, thank you very much. There is one more question. I'm going to answer that and then we stop. Susan says, if it's just part of a virus, would it cause a lot of damage? No, that is why they're saying that there is not a lot of uh, inflammation there. But at the same time, if you see just the S1 hanging out in the monocytes is causing monocytes to be mad. So similarly, when this part is hanging out in the tissue unnecessarily, that would cause low level of inflammation, which would cause slow burn of the tissue. Sunshine, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to take rest. So we will have a walk tomorrow. I am so sorry that I missed the walk last time. I was just sleeping with COVID. Um, so let's meet again. Cool Beans Cafe. Uh, Doug, I am a little tired. I think I'm just at the end of the COVID. And I find it a little difficult to stay sitting up for two, three hours. I have been drawing this since 12 o'clock. So if I would love to do it, but if we can uh, skip today, I will do a walk tomorrow. Then hopefully from next week, we'll be back to normal. Thank you very much. You all have a great weekend. Stay safe, happy, and healthy. I do a lot of hard work for you. I myself was lax on the protocols and I got punished for it. Please don't be lax on it. Don't follow me. <laughs> so thank you very much. And I'll see you tomorrow for walk and Monday for talk. <laughs>